We come to the main text for the day of Pentecost. It's in Acts 2, very traditional for this day. It's being read all over Christendom, all over the world, on this very day as the celebration of the birthday of our church. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. The Greek here means they're drunk. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem. Let this be made known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning, too early to be drunk. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who comes calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The dignity of difference, that is the subject before the house today. The dignity of difference. I take this sermon title from the title of a book by one of the chief rabbis of our time, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who wrote this amazing book called The Dignity of of difference. Some of my thoughts for this sermon come from this book and I want to give him credit. Wouldn't it be nice if we were all the same and thought exactly the same way about everything politically, theologically, ethically, socially? But of course we don't because we hear things from our own perspective. I got an email the other day about uh, fifth and sixth graders taking a history exam and what some of them said on the exam. One boy said this, Socrates was an old Greek teacher who went around giving people advice. One day, he died from an overdose of wedlock, (laughs) which apparently is poisonous, he said. And after his death, he's, his career suffered a dramatic decline. We hear things from our own 
perspectives. That's why we are so different. But at Pentecost, in the passage I just read, everyone was able to hear and to agree on things and listen to each other in a way they'd never listened before. Uh, the problem with this picture, as sweet and beautiful, full of light and idyllic as it is, is that it's not really true in our time, is that we are at each other's throats these days. We are a nation divided against itself. We listen to radio stations that agree with us. We read the papers and watch the news that promotes our own ideology. E.J. Dion was on the Diane Reem show one day and he was making this point that it seems worse than any other time. Oh, we had the 60s, yes, those of us who are old enough remember the 60s, but it still seems more sinister now, more difficult than that, says E.J. Dion. Look at how we are treating each other. It's not just Washington, it's everywhere. It's even here, in our own city, in our own communities, wherever we live. We find ourselves almost at each other's throats. And whatever the cause, our country is in a mess right now. It seems like we are embroiled in a very uncivil war in our nation right now. It, it, the reason is we can't listen to people with whom we disagree. And they can't seem to listen to us. We are living in what is called the politics of confrontation that mutes real conversation where public discourse suffers. And it's true everywhere. We can see it in marriages that are on the rocks. It's my way or the highway. There's no give and takes. We don't listen to our spouses the way maybe we should. In most cases, we see it in the church. That's the saddest place. Not just a particular church, but the church at large. Pick a denomination, any denomination, any denomination, or a non-denominational church, and I will show you a powder keg that is about to explode. Washington's wrangling causes pain for our nation, and our ecclesiastical squabbles do damage to the body politic of the body of Christ. No wonder atheists scoff at religion's influence. Rabbi Sachs says in the conflict zones around the world, whether it be Northern Ireland or Middle East or East Timor, religion is at the cutting edge of the confrontation, reminding us of Jonathan Swift's acid observation that we have just enough religion to make us hate one another, but not enough religion to make us love one another. How are we ever going to get out of this? The answer, of course, is Pentecost, this amazing scene where the Spirit helps people begin to hear in a way they've never heard before that overcomes the barriers between races and languages and ideologies and beliefs. It's a beautiful image that we see here in the passage we read this morning. It's an idyllic image. It's, it's a lovely image. And it helps us understand that Pentecost is not just a celebration of the birthday of the church. It is a symbol for the possibility of true peace in our families, among our friendships, in our communities, in our nation, and in our world. It's right there in that amazing scene at Pentecost. Now, what, what happened here? How, how does it happen? I think in two ways. One, Pentecost helps us celebrate the dignity of our differences. It helps us recognize the dignity of our differences. And secondly, it helps us listen to people with whom we disagree on all sorts of things. It helps us meet God and actually see God in the face of the stranger the face of the enemy, the enemy we have politically or theologically or ideologically. If we can understand that Pentecost helps us see God in that stranger's face, then it doesn't need to be a threat to our identity, even though it 
calls for a kind of moral and spiritual generosity that is more demanding than we usually have. It's a radical move that involves the exorcism of Plato's ghost who continues to promote a universalism that leaves little room for the local, the unique, and the particular. You see, Plato's assertion is, a, is about a universal truth. And it's okay, it's valid, as long as it's applied to science and the description of what is, but it's not valid when it's applied to ethics or spirituality or the sense of what ought to be. See, this is the difference between nature and culture. Cultures are like languages. They are infinitely varied. Think about it. English is not Spanish. French is not German. Greek is not Chinese and so forth. Each language is the product of its own community, its history, its shared responsibilities, and its sensibilities. What does this mean? It means that we have a language that is never unaltered or complete. It is constantly in motion. And the same is true of religion. So Sachs offers this. Rabbi Sachs says, remember that the God of the Bible is not a Platonist who just sort of goes around loving humanity in a sort of a, some abstract form of humanity. No, the God of the Bible is a particularist who loves each child as that child is, choosing Isaac, but also blessing Ishmael, you know, favoring Jacob, but also telling God's children not to hate Esau. So the God of Abraham and Sarah teaches all of humanity a more complex truth than is possible by simple oppositions to one another. Think about it. We are the same, and yet we are also different. We are a part of the human race, but we are also members of a specific family, tribe, history, and heritage. So what does this mean? It means we need to celebrate our differences, and that's what they did at that first Pentecost. They celebrated their differences, and they did so in such a way that they began to hear each other in a way they had never heard before. They began to hear the stranger, the different one, the one with whom they disagreed on all kinds of things. Think about this for a moment. Did you know that the verse, love your neighbor as yourself, is on only one place in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible says love your neighbor only once, but love your stranger, love the stranger in your life 36 times, which means that we are called to listen in a way we have never listened before. It means walking a mile in someone else's shoes, not the way the comedian Steve Martin says it, you know. He says, oh, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Well, look, that's pretty cool. You get to be a mile away from that person and you got their shoes. No, it's not that way. No. Walk a mile in someone else's shoes means I will feel and you will feel the way the other person feels. You will understand the pain and the disappointment and the frustration that that other person feels. And you will be able to admit that sometimes you're not always right about everything. E.J. Dion, in that interview with Diane Rehm on her radio show, said, that's a sign of real strength. And then she put him on, her, put him on his heels when she said, well, wait a minute, uh, do you think that conservatives are worse at listening to people with whom they disagree than liberals are? And E.J. Dion just surprised me by saying, no, I actually think my liberal friends and I are just as guilty of not listening the way we should to those with whom we disagree as the right-wingers on the other side. And then he went on to quote Reinhold Niebuhr, 
who said that original sin is the only logically verifiable doctrine in the Christian faith because it touches every one of us, conservatives and liberals alike. We are all touched by sin. And Dion went on to say that when you are able to say to another with whom you disagree, you know, I may be wrong about what I originally thought about that then that's a sign of real humility and strength, which Abraham Lincoln had. We know the stories. We've read the novels. We've seen the movies. Abraham Lincoln was able to look at an opponent and say, you know, you actually might be right about that, and I think I may be wrong. Unfortunately, we don't have politicians in Washington with that Lincoln-esque approach, and that's really sad because this is the kind of statesmanship our nation needs right now. We live amidst a politics of confrontation when what we really need is a politics of paradox, a dialectical tension which promotes not winners and losers, but a culture where everyone wins something. For over two centuries, America has cobbled together this tenuous democracy based on the strained civility of public discourse. But the problem now is we are all talking past each other in self-serving soliloquies that are anything but civil. This fragile experiment we call America may not be around forever. Other great civilizations like Israel, Greece, and Rome came to an end because they forgot how to work with each other. And like trees rotting from within, they fell more from the weight of their own pain and their own disagreement than they did from the assault of outside sources. Why would we treat ourselves this way? The threat of our demise is less from the terrorism without than from the implosion within. Why would we bring on our own demise by treating ourselves as enemies? It makes no sense. And how do we get out of it? The answer is Pentecost. It's more than just a little passage you read on a Sunday morning and then we all go home and live our lives the way we've always been living. No, it calls into question. All of us, me included, how we are listening to each other. Because the Spirit of God opened their hearts to listen in a way that they had never listened before. How are we going to do it? The world asked. How are we going to do it? And Peter says, I'll tell you how. Let me tell you about the one we call Jesus Christ. Get to know him and then you will know not only how to do it, but what to do. To this one, be all honor and blessing and glory and praise from this day forth and forevermore. God bless you all.